Welcome to the keynote talk on Edge Intelligence, the Convergence of Humans, IoT, and AI. In this talk, I'm going to discuss the recent developments of IoT, Edge, Fog, and Cloud Computing and how that actually relates to artificial intelligence. Um, some of the issues are uh, pretty recent and discuss research challenges uh, lying ahead of us. So when we look into the current developments of systems development, we realize that actually in the, compared to the past, we are facing a new situation. And the new situation is as such that in the past we had uh, people interacting with systems only. They were not part of the systems themselves typically. And the other novelty is that the Internet of Things has arrived. Um, so the question is, how do we actually integrate the systems into the design, into the modeling, into the monitoring and its relationship to the other components? And finally, the third aspect of the evolution of current information systems is that software services are also part of this. In the past, we were only focusing on software services predominantly. People were outside the system simply interacting with the system. So the question now becomes, how do we actually design systems, monitor systems, build systems, test systems, which are composed out of the three components of people, software services, and things. And there are a couple of examples uh, of such systems, which I call elastic systems. So we have representations of those in smart homes, in uh, health network systems, in governmental administrative systems, uh, in transportation uh, systems and transportation networks, as many of you work in this space. Energy networks is another example. All of these systems have as an example that they are actually built with these three building blocks. And the question remains, how do we actually create these systems? Now, when we look at these types of systems, we realize that these three components, these three entities are intimately connected with each other. So everything is connected with each other. And this represents a fundamental challenge that, that actually lies in front of us. When we look into uh, or we look at a system such as this, we can make a comparison to ecosystems in nature, for example. In nature, what we see here is a system which is composed, like is depicted in this figure here, the, um, composed of uh, uh, the sun, the birds, the rocks, the water, the fish, the plants, everything uh, as in, in depicted in this marine ecosystem example. And what we can see here is that we are seeing a complex system which is uh, intrinsically uh, connected. It is a complex network. It has network dependencies and as such it also has adaptive behavior. And I think this is pretty similar to the type of system that we have to build in the future. A ecosystem like this one depicted here has a number of very interesting features we should study in engineering. One is that it is resilient and robust in a sense that it has these mechanisms built in. Um, so it achieves stability even in the presence of disruption. That disruption is somehow uh, key to ecosystems. They are resilient in a sense that they are adapting to the situation and this adaptation is not really visible with, within when we just look at the building blocks. So these yellow arrows that you see here on uh, between the entities in this marine ecosystem, they have actually built in some resilient mechanism. And I will discuss that what I believe uh, could be helpful for systems design that mimics this behavior. The second aspect is that what we see in ecosystems is that we, we have measures of health. So in other words, we can say something about how healthy is that system? Uh, how healthy uh, is it regarding key indicators of the system itself? Um, the third aspect is that it has built-in coherence. This means that the system itself is uh, having, so to say, a purpose. It has a focus. Uh, and by that, it actually helps to, to not uh, decompose in itself, which is the fourth uh, attribute, which is that ecosystems typically have some properties of being entropy resistant. Entropy being a measure which we know um, 
from other sciences is that uh, it's a measure of disorder. So uh, also in information systems, we know that systems which are not maintained, they tend to disorder, they have a high entropy. And this is also very true for systems, ecosystems in our world nowadays, where we have people, software systems, and things being meshed together. So what we can say essentially is that these ecosystems that we are seeing, um, they can be kind of, uh, we can also map what we see in nature and map that to the uh, IT uh, world, if you like. So instead of the players in the, in, in the natural world with the sun, the gravitational pull, the fishes, the rocks, the plants, etc., we have all kinds of different entities, as, we, as I was arguing before. We have all these different uh, infrastructures in the IT world, such as uh, storage, computational power, networks, different IoT devices, sensors, what have you, cloud computers, etc. All of these are actually building blocks of our ecosystems that we have to build. And one of the fundamental challenges that is lying in front of us is that we have to learn better and to uh, become much better at how do we actually design such systems that have all these different entities being put together. So simply creating systems from a fragmented worldview is not sufficient anymore. This fragmentation has led to a number of massive problems. And if we don't stop following this fragmentation, it will become. One example I would like to bring here uh, is the smart city itself. If you look at a smart city, what we can say is that in a smart city, we have things in the sense of the Internet of Things, right? So we have all types of sensors, fire sensors, air sensors, traffic density sensors, video surveillance of all sorts, humidity sensors, sensors for trash, sensors for parking spaces, for containers, uh, smart meters, etc. So this is pretty common and we are getting more and more used to these types of uh, sensors and Internet of Things. The second aspect that, that we are having experience is we have, of course, software services out there. We have systems that uh, measuring uh, traffic control, detecting the people, detecting uh, uh, facility management aspects, providing services for water management, um, uh, garbage collection, automated parking, etc. Those software services are actually building on top of the data that they get from different types of sensors. So these software services have been the primary concern of the computer science community, of course, because we are building uh, software systems. Now those things increasingly are being becoming, a, so to say, a first class citizen in the types of systems that we have to create. The third aspect are people, right? So we are, as people, also participants in this smart city. Um, we are uh, running around, we provide uh, information uh, where we go, which uh, spaces we go to, which places we go to, how long we spend our time there, etc. And finally, when we also have a look at the data aspects, we realize that this data is actually creating a, a, a lot of rich richness in, in the sense because everything is then becoming provided together. The, things, the software services, the people, and all of the data that is connecting all of those aspects together. So what we have learned in the last decade or so is that we should provide everything as a service. So in other words, all of these different building blocks in such an ecosystem are provided as a service in order to be able to compose these different building blocks together. I think this is one of the main lessons in the last decade from service-oriented architectures that we are able to actually compose systems. And this composition of systems in the past has been focused on software, and now we are increasingly uh, moving towards uh, this composition with services, not only from traditional software components, but now also with hardware components and increasingly uh, with things as well. And now this is a very interesting aspect, which I'm going to discuss uh, in, in, in the future here. So when we look into the types of systems that we currently have that we can utilize, 
we can see that there are different perspectives. If you look at the spectrum of te technologies provided today, we have the IoT, we have the Edge, we have the Cloud, we have the Internet, we have the Fox. So how are they related with each other? So one way to look at it is, is, is a cloud-centric perspective. So the cloud-centric perspective basically says that the cloud is the center of the universe. Everything is connected to the cloud. So in other words, even the internet is not the center of the universe. It is just all leading to the cloud. All the data is uh, stored on the cloud. All the intelligence is uh, on the cloud. Uh, the things are actually outside, still connected to the cloud. Without the cloud computing infrastructure, there is no decision making, there is no intelligence. So that would be equal to, if I use another analogy, if we use uh, the human brain as a representative uh, of the intelligence and we say all the decisions are being made by the brain only. There is no autonomic nervous system. All the decision making, like taking every breath every, every couple of seconds, is basically delegated to the brain, which is not the case. So we do have different layers here in place. Uh, for example, the autonomic nervous system, which basically thinks, uh, delegates certain aspects to lower um, abstractions, if you wish. So um, in the IoT world, this basically represents pretty much the situation that we currently have. This means that all of the information is streamed from IoT sensors to the cloud. All the learning is happening on the cloud. The decisions are made on the cloud and is then pushed back to the actuator level on the lower uh, levels of abstraction of, of the network, if you like. So this is the cloud-centric perspective. Of course, this has been the predominant uh, way that we are designing systems nowadays. There is another alternative view of this, which is the what I call here the internet-centric perspective, which basically says the internet itself is uh, the internet as it is. And all of these different aspects like the cloud, the IoT, the edge are all lay, lay, layers around this uh, internet. So this has a number of, uh, a, a lot of impacts actually on the design decisions that we make. One is that the cloud-centric perspective, as I was saying, has this assumption that there is a central intelligence and all data has to be uh, sent to the cloud. Of course, this has tremendous impact on the network itself and um, also a lot of implications on what it actually means for the system's design regarding networking, storage, computational power, scaling, and etc. Um, the internet-centric perspective has a different set of assumptions. It actually also assumes that there is some level of autonomy at the edge of the network. So in other words, when you look at where the data is actually coming from, that part is closer to the edges of the network, right? So you have IoT sensors, those IoT sensors actually create data. That data then is uh, computed, stored, learned, what have you, and then maybe um, sent somewhere else for further processing, but not necessarily. So there is some level of autonomy towards the edges of the network. And this is, of course, the uh, paradigm that we are uh, moving towards. So in other words, what we can say is that we can see pretty much every 10 years the pendulum between centralization and decentralization going back and forth. In the last 10 years, we pretty much had a centralization uh, uh, pull towards cloud computing. Um, and now what we are observing is that there is a lot of uh, push again to the decentralized aspects, to the distribution aspects, which means that aspects like uh, edge computing um, become more prominent now because now the question becomes is it possible to actually do processing on also towards the edges of the network um, why is that important we are witnessing a number of uh, examples uh, in different domains and i have depicted a couple of those domains here in this example slide on, on analytics where we can actually think about different scenarios. 
so one scenario could be that I would like to ask questions such as, what actually is the energy consumption of the building I'm currently in? Or what is the energy consumption of all the buildings in this street? What is the energy consumption uh, of all the buildings of uh, this certain region where I'm actually situated in? Um, or I could ask another question. I could say basically going across different domains, I could ask questions regarding social well-being, um, such as what is the, the wellness situation in a certain region of town, in a certain street, in a certain set of buildings? Or governments could ask uh, questions such as what is the uh, situation regarding waste management re in a certain region, in a certain street, in a certain uh, number of streets, etc. So these types of questions illustrate that the traditional way that we have uh, been building vertical systems with uh, very you know, closed types of questions that we can ask then is actually coming to an end. And we have to design systems in a different way namely in a way where everything is provided as a service and we can also ask questions in a different way where we can have different ways to look into the data, put these aspects together and make sense out of them. Now, this brings us to the current situation and the current situation is that we have a whole continuum of mm, paradigms de facto ready to, to serve us. This is what I call here in this slide the IoT Edge Fork Cloud Continuum. On a, from a high-level perspective, what we can say is that we have different levels of uh, in this architecture. So what we can see is that we have uh, the low on the lowest layer we have uh, a, a number of IoT devices under quotes. These IoT devices can be many different things, right? They can be a car or in one part of a car, but they can also be like a mobile device or a camera for video surveillance, etc. Uh, on the next levels, we have actually uh, a number of edge devices, so-called edge devices, or previously called gateways, which accumulate data from a number of such IoT sensors. These IoT sensors basically do not have the capacity to transfer all of their data directly to the cloud. So what they do is a number of these IoT devices uh, bun are bundled and their data is being processed, stored, whatever, on different edge devices. On the next layer, uh, these edge devices uh, could be uh, uh, synchronized, put together, if you like, under the umbrella of so-called fog computing. In fog computing, basically, you could say that different uh, providers, such as telco operators, could accumulate a number of this data from different edge providers and operate and uh, compute and store, etc., uh, on those base stations in the fog uh, and do some processing and make some decisions, etc. And those fog uh, base stations could then also transfer data or not making that decision to uh, the cloud. Whereas the cloud itself could also be a private cloud, a public cloud, or a hybrid cloud. So there are different ways how we could see that. So what we can observe is that de facto there is a whole set of uh, a compute continuum. It is not only uh, the cloud or the fog, etc. They all actually have to play together in order to make a useful uh, use of all of these uh, services. Now, what we can see is that all of these different um, uh, layers of abstraction which are currently uh, available are actually provided also by different entities. So, what we can observe now is that we have the IT companies, predominantly the big five IT companies, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, etc., providing a lot of cloud infrastructure. On the other hand, there are a number of telcos, telco operators uh, uh, moving um, very prominently, like Huawei or others, into pushing their offerings into becoming fog or edge providers, right? 
Now, this is a very interesting uh, aspect because um, uh, these edge providers can be these manufacturers uh, of this networking or the telcos itself themselves. And they can then provide a number of uh, infrastructure components which also are useful for corporations or for individuals to store uh, their software on. And the question is then, how do we actually as engineers create that software which is then transcending the individual organizational boundaries and going to be deployed, managed, monitored, etc., on all of these different parts of the infrastructure. So we have a, a very large uh, complex infrastructure composing, uh, composed, being composed of IoT sensors, edge gateways, fog base stations, cloud computing uh, data centers, and application providers have a hybrid scenario where they have to create these mechanisms to decide where their application components can be actually deployed. Are they deployed on edge devices? Are they deployed on fog devices, base stations, or on the cloud? Who is responsible? So the most likely scenario de facto is that this is a hybrid scenario for many uh, entities. And the question then is, what are the mechanisms that we are actually creating, managing, and governing this diverse infrastructure? Now, if you look at it uh, from a uh, higher level perspective, you can see that the question then becomes, how can I shift, move, basically, data, software, decision-making, models, learning, horizontally uh, or vertically along these uh, lines of what we were just discussing. This is one of the fundamental high-level questions which are uh, very is very difficult to answer de facto because it depends on so many different aspects. And we're going to discuss this in the next couple of, uh, of slides. This computing continuum is ranging a huge uh, set of infrastructure components from data centers, uh, on servers to mini computers to clusters of smaller boxes to micro clouds as is depicted on, on, on this uh, slide that you see here. And there are many different uh, research questions that one can ask, namely, how is it possible that we design systems, software in particular, that is able to move between these different uh, computing continuum devices? Because in reality, we don't want to create software which is only running on one particular set of hardware. We would like to have that software being able to run on micro clouds as depicted on the right hand side here with Raspberry Pis or what have you, but also able to move to, to cloud infrastructures and data centers. And this is one of the fundamental challenges what we have. So this means that we have to ask ourselves the question, how can we move towards what I call here edge intelligence? How is it possible that we create a computational fabric which allows us to use all of these dispersed resources and allow for training, monitoring and serving of these models? And what is in particular very difficult is because we have a heterogeneous applications and models and they require different parts of the infrastructure and because of the scale of the infrastructure, they also require different mechanisms. And finally, all of this AI infrastructure uh, for edge intelligence also needs to be automated at some point, right? So this automation is a beast in itself, if you like. So what is necessary for such an, a fabric of edge intelligence? In particular, I would like to talk about three uh, aspects. The first one is sensing or sensor data as a service. So basically, we have a large number of dynamic and mobile pops up uh, publishers and subscribers of sensor data and quality of service requirements in this edge intelligence scenarios. And so far, what we have typically in industry is a centralized messaging services such as Amazon Web Service IoT or Microsoft Azure IoT Hub. But we have to move away from the centralized approach to a highly decentralized approach for sensing. This is number one. 
The second aspect is that we increasingly have edge computing devices and networks with modular AI capabilities. This means that we have a lot of AI accelerators for these edge devices. A number of examples like Google Edge TPU, uh, Microsoft uh, Brainwave. We have uh, examples from Intel, Baidu or Huawei. The third aspect is that all of this is all nice. But of course, the power lies in the coordination of it all. And this means that we have to have intelligent orchestration mechanisms for the decentralized and distributed infrastructure. Now, these different edge AI accelerators I was talking about here, you can see some depiction of how it actually looks like. So increasingly, these AI capabilities uh, these uh, neural components, etc., are being put on hardware and being provided to the different building blocks of the typical hardware devices that we actually use in our compute infrastructure every day. We are also experimenting a lot with these types of uh, systems, creating our own edge intelligence, intelligence fabric, where we actually put uh, this AI acceleration uh, on top of Raspberry Pis, for example, where we have intelligent decision making on where which uh, raspberries to uh, uh, switch on and switch off depending on the energy consumption or different uh, optimization criteria and then uh, provide a learning mechanism uh, in, in this example depicted in this picture and you can see a number of uh, examples provided here in the slide where we actually do research uh, based on this so this is pretty much uh, early, early research in this space where we look into, into these aspects. Now, when we look into the question of, we have now all of these infrastructure components uh, of this uh, ecosystem that we were talking about initially. And now, if you remember the slide I was showing about natural ecosystems, the different building blocks had uh, these yellow arrows, right? And these yellow arrows were essentially one of the fundamental building blocks, as I believe, uh, for these types of systems. Uh, why? Because they enable resilience. And one of the fundamental mechanisms to enable resilience is to allow for elasticity. Now, elasticity is a property that we know from physics, from material science, which says something about the property of the material. If you put stress on it, it will deform. If you take away the stress, it will go back to its initial state. This is what uh, elasticity is. And the question now is, is it possible to actually create, to replicate that, um, uh, that mechanism that we know from material science, from nature, also into the world of computer science. Is it possible to create systems that are not only able to scale, but also able to have elasticity uh, properties? What do I mean? When you look at scalability, we build systems typically with the worst case in mind. The worst case means that we create the system having the worst case assumption about the number of people accessing the system, the worst case uh, assumption about how many, uh, how many database queries, what is the network load, what is the load on the system properties, the software, etc., etc. However, most of the time it is not the worst case that is actually happening in reality. Uh, so ideally, what we would like to have is a property of elasticity, right? So in a sense, mimicking also our own human body. So when there is a lot of stress, we are able to leave the comfort zone, so to speak, provide a higher heart rate, etc. But if we if we relax, we go back to the norm. Um, so similarly, what we would like to have is a system which is able to add and remove resources. So this is typically what is understood with uh, under elasticity. This is one aspect which is important and good. That resource elasticity means not only hardware resources or software resources, but in fact could also mean additional people resources. Uh, but I don't have time in this talk to go deeper into this. But resource elasticity is one aspect. The other aspect are two other components. One is quality elasticity, meaning that I would have consider 
to consider all non-functional parameters as well. So for example, I'm concerned in uh, the aspect of quality of the data input and quality of the data output as well. And the third aspect would be cost elasticity. So in other words, what I am interested in or what we as designers of such systems are typically interested in is not only how many resources do I want to add and remove for a particular uh, time in space, but what I would like to do is I would like to create a system which is able to add resources, remove resources in order to provide necessary quality of the data, quality of the service input and output, also considering the cost. And this is what we mean with uh, elastic computing. So this means that every system essentially that we are designing from now on has to create and operate inside this trade-off model in this three-dimensional space. So we basically say, okay, I'm going to use this amount or this type of resource provided that I get this quality of the data, for example, a data resolution, but only if the cost is not higher than X. If you cannot provide that sweet spot in this three-dimensional space, I'm not interested at all, or I have a different type of uh, thing that I would like to uh, get from the infrastructure. So this is now interesting because we are able to formulate these different elasticity requirements from a system that we would like to have in this uh, computing continuum. However, there is not such a system in place where I can define this elasticity policies really. So we have created one basically represented in this slide uh, in one of the EU projects that we had a couple of years ago where we are able to define with a language that we have created called Sybil, what are the actual constraints that we would like to define and what are the strategies that we need to follow. And then this intelligence is then built into, in this case, the cloud infrastructure um, that allows us to move and shift different deployments deployed on different virtual machines in order to satisfy the constraints that we have defined. But as you can see here, those constraint satisfactions are done or formulated on a higher level of abstraction, right? Um, so, for example, I would like to have uh, maximum data freshness, but only if the I.O. cost is smaller uh, than three euro, as, as depicted in this example. And if it's not the case, I will try to resolve that by shifting uh, things around and if it's possible uh, the service is provided if it's not possible to provide that elasticity requirement then it is not provided so this is a very fundamental new way to approach the design of such systems so in a sense what we would achieve with this is that we can look at the timeline of any application uh, along the time axis and what we see is that we define the elasticity space and the elasticity space basically says something about is my application within these boundaries that I have defined as constraints depicted with these orange lines at the bottom and at the top and the elasticity pathway basically says something about the characterization of the elasticity behavior for a particular view so for example I could say then okay how does my cost actually evolves over time and I can look at the pathway and can say, okay, my, my costs uh, evolve over time along this uh, pathway. And then I can make decisions if the dimensioning of my systems is a, a good thing or not. Now, this is one of the important uh, aspects, I think, the elasticity aspect. Now let's shift gears and look into the uh, uh, learning aspect. As we have discussed in the IoT world, edge, fog, and cloud world, we have a fundamental uh, issue. All of this data that is coming in uh, from, from remote uh, devices uh, has a particular purpose, right? So we have to train on that data, either, either directly or uh, using those remote devices, actually without revealing the data themselves. So the question is typically, where does the model aggregation uh, where does the, uh, the global model actually, where is it being created? Can it be created somewhere along this con continuum? Or everything has to be created on the cloud? 
and then made uh, available to other sites. And this is one of the fundamental questions and this, if you look into more detail, brings a lot of different issues. So there are a, a lot of different applications which require a solution to this aspect of uh, this intelligence spread across this co computing continuum. Um, for mobile devices, for example, uh, face detection, voice recognition, training on data for, from smartphones, cameras, microphones, but we don't want to uh, reveal our own identity. So is it possible to learn uh, on, on individual devices and make use of that learning without revealing who I am? That's for personal devices. For organizations, the question is, is it possible to, to learn here? Uh, for example, in hospitals, but not to expose the data of the individual patients. Um, for higher level of abstractions, so uh, for environmental transportation, smart homes, etc. So sensors in smart homes is a similar example. So can I provide some learnings to other levels of abstraction without, you know, making my identity known to others? Um, so this is one of the fundamental aspects that we are facing now. So this basically leads to a number of research challenges that we have to face. So uh, basically what, what I call here device recruitment strategies. So which subsets of devices uh, are assisting in these learning tasks? Processing, storage, battery, etc. is related to this. Uh, questions regarding volatility. The devices, they can disappear, appear at any point in time. This brings with it a number of challenges. The timing aspect, so asynchrony. asynchrony. Uh, so the algorithms, they face challenges when end devices do not submit their data in a timely manner. Um, Non-independent and identically distributed data. So what do we do when the data is inaccurate, when uh, personalization is lost? heterogeneity in the volume of training data per device uh, might lead actually to biased model. So this bias in the model, because we have different volume or different uh, uh, detail of the data, is a very fundamental problem too. So we are giving prejudice then to one particular uh, data source when we have more data than the other. So this is a, a problem in, in the model creation. Preventing privacy leaks. So some private information may be inferred even if the devices do not transmit uh, the actual data. So there are a lot of publications and research discussing exactly this. Um, incentives to misbehave, basically. So why waste battery when I can let the others do all the work, right? So this is also one of the research challenges. So based on this, we have created a research roadmap, which I would like to present to you, which is uh, published in the paper called Edge Intelligence, the confluence of edge computing and uh, artificial intelligence, which is forthcoming in the IEEE IoT journal. But you can see a preprint now on my homepage, but also on the IEEE IoT journal page, which basically discusses what are the research challenges in this uh, aspect. And we look at it from the perspective from the user first with the quality of experience as we call it here. And what is the quality of experience that the user uh, designer actually wants from such a system in, in, with the edge intelligence? So there are five different distinct aspects. The first one is performance, right? So I would like to have the ratio uh, of computation offloading. I have to have a, a, a distinct decision how do I want to make this offloading to these different areas of my compute continuum? The second aspect relates, for example, to cost. So how much does the computation cost? How much does the communication cost? Uh, how much is the energy consumption cost? The third is regarding privacy and security. So aspects like federated learning. So can I aggregate local machine models from distributed edge devices? Efficiency, uh, I would like to have excellent performance with a low overhead, so model compression, conditional computation becomes key here, and reliability. So can I uh, have a model upload and download in wireless network, even if it is congested, right? So based on this, 
uh, different high-level quality of experience questions, I can then make the distinction between AI for the edge or AI on the edge. This is now a very fundamental distinction which I would like to discuss here. So if we look at AI for the edge, we have a number of uh, research questions which relate the bottom-up strategy in a, in a sense. So we look at topologies, so the edge orchestration and coordination with small base stations or unmanned aerial, uh, aerial vehicles and access point. So how is the, orchestra how is the topology uh, composed here? The second aspect regards content. So lightweight service framework for quality of service where services for mobile devices is one example, right? So how do we uh, consider the content here? And the third aspect would be computational offloading. So user profile migration and mobility management. So that is regarding AI for the edge. Um, there are grand challenges in this way of uh, AI for the edge. One is regarding uh, model establishment. So how to uh, do, how to restrain the optimization model. There are different approaches in literature. For example, stochastic gradient descent me uh, method or the mini batch gradient descent method. Then there are questions regarding algorithmic development. So selection of which edge device should be responsible for the deployment and execution in an online manner, right? That might actually change over time. As we had said, it is a volatile situation. So the edge devices might also come and go. So the algorithms need to cater for that. So the state of the art formulates a combinatorial and NP hard optimization problem with high computational complexity in this. And thirdly, a grand challenge is the trade-off between optimality uh, and efficiency. So we have to consider the resource constraint devices. As you remember, this compute continuum between IoT, Edge, Fork, Cloud has all sorts of different uh, capacities. So this is a fundamental challenge. And then finally, AI on the Edge discusses the top-down uh, perspective. Basically, it looks at questions like data availability. So, for example, as we have seen, uh, the, the, the challenge of the lack of availability and usability of raw training data for model training and inference is a fundamental problem. And the bias problem is also very real because the data is coming from different mobile devices, edge devices, etc. And the question is, what if there is a, the raw data is not available? Second aspect, model selection. So the state of the art requires selection of a need to be trained AI model, and that has a number of challenges, of course. The thresholds of learning accuracy and scale of these AI models for quick deployment and delivery is, is also a problem. And the selection uh, of probe training frameworks and accelerator architectures under limited resources is a problem. And finally, the coordination mechanism between these heterogeneous devices, clouds, and all of these middlewares and APIs is a fundamental problem. So as you can see, there are a number of different problems uh, still for AI on the edge or AI for the edge, which we have to master. So far, uh, we are still in the middle of the research in, in the different research communities. So there is no uh, you know, agreed upon or best way to do things. Ultimately, what we need to do is we need to manage the whole AI lifecycle in an automated fashion because we have to create a pipeline which monitors available data, runtime performance data, etc., and then creates an automated uh, training and retraining loop. And this is, of course, a fundamental challenge that we all face in this community. Finally, I would like to provide you with an uh, uh, operations workflow uh, overview basically if you look at this whole continuum what we were discussing now map the AI part and map it to the infrastructure part and discuss along the lines of different data characteristics model characteristics and enabling technologies and provide a, a number of use cases where this is relevant and uh, we can distinguish different scenarios from cloud to cloud, cloud to edge, edge to cloud, and edge to edge, as you can see here on the left-hand side, regarding this data model and enabling technologies. 
And all of these built a matrix, basically, of different possibilities of where research needs uh, to, to go. So with this, I would like to conclude this presentation. Basically, we, we understood that we have to leverage the whole computing continuum from IoT, Edge, Fog, and Cloud. So we have a hybrid infrastructure set of components from the hardware and from the software, which we need to uh, develop, to monitor, to maintain, to manage, to govern. And the challenge is that these different infrastructure components are belonging to different organizational entities from telco operators to IT companies to private organizations, uh, etc., which is a fundamental challenge in itself. Secondly, the computational fabric for this intelligent aspect is being mapped towards these different infrastructure components, right? So we have AI for the edge, we have AI on the edge, and both of these have actually their own distinct research challenges, which we have outlined here. So, and finally, one of the underlying uh, messages I would like to give here is that we need to have a fundamental new perspective on all of this. We need to understand that um, we have to develop an ecosystem perspective on this infrastructure. We have to create a fabric view on this infrastructure. This fragmented way of designing systems, operating systems that like we did in the past is clearly not sufficient enough for the future. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if uh, some of you are working in the space of uh, Internet of Things, I would like to encourage you also to submit your research work to a new uh, ACM transactions on the Internet of Things. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if uh, some of you are working in the space of uh, Internet of Things, I would like to encourage you also to submit your research work to a new uh, ACM transactions on the Internet of Things. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.